Starting off this countdown, we have Elizabeth Wetlofer. This is, I've done this and I'm ready to face it, but I would love to go. Elizabeth Wetlofer was a Canadian registered nurse for nine years in southwestern Ontario. In 2016, she quit her nursing job, checked herself into a psychiatric hospital, and confessed to her crimes. Apparently, between 2007 to 2016, she used her powers as a nurse to take the lives of eight of her patients and injured six others. She would do so by giving them lethal doses of insulin. She also admitted to stealing opioids to fuel her personal addiction. After she confessed to the killings, an interview took place with the police. Police, and that's when she confessed her crimes once again, this time in a detailed statement. Apparently, she had voices in her head telling her to kill those patients. Part of me had started to believe that it was the devil, mm -hmm. and part of me thought it might be God. My life. At first, she believed that this was God talking to her, so she felt okay killing for him. Then later on, she thought maybe it was the devil. On top of that, she claimed that it was a gut instinct telling her that these people needed to be killed. And once she did the deed, she would hear laughter in her chest. And when I would do it afterwards, I would hear like a laughter in my head. She was sentenced to eight concurrent life sentences with no chance of parole for 25 years. In our ninth spot, we have Robert Durst. Robert Durst is an American convicted murderer and possible serial killer. It all started in 1982 with the disappearance of his wife, Kathy Durst. Obviously, he was the main suspect. Then in 2000, he murdered one of his friends, Susan Berman, and in 2001, he killed his neighbor. And just this year, he was finally convicted for killing his wife. During his interviews and interrogations, he maintained his innocence, claiming that he never did it. But after one of his final interviews, he made a grave mistake. He went to the bathroom and didn't realize that his mic was still on. While in the bathroom, he was talking to himself and basically confessed to the killings. There it is. You're caught. The interviewers were completely shocked by what they heard, and Robert was immediately arrested. In our 8th spot, we have Daniel Wozniak. Daniel Wozniak is a former community theater actor who in May of 2010 took the lives of two people. During that time, he was struggling financially. He was in debt and unemployed. Then when he heard that his friend Sam Hur had $62,000 from combat pay, he decided to kill Sam in order to steal his money. Then he ended up killing a woman named Julie Kabushi, a 23-year-old college student who was tutoring Sam. His plan was to make it seem like Sam killed Julie and then went on the run. But in the end, he was caught. This video is from the police interrogation of Daniel. Here's him putting the blame on Sam. I told the door, it was Sam. Hi. I'm like, hey man, what's going on? Everything good? And he's like, not good. We're in trouble. We need to get the out of here. And so he's like, there's a dead body in my apartment. He said he'd been doing some heavy drugs. He's like, I shot somebody. I was not happy about it. It was a fit of rage. And honestly, she had it coming. I said she. But of course, the police weren't buying his story. It was all too convenient. Where's the gun, Sam? What did you do with the gun? I'm not Sam. My name's Dan. I know, but that's what you heard. Wasn't that what you were asking him? No, I have nothing to do with this because my life was in danger with my wife. I'm sorry. How was your life in danger? He threatened it. The two interrogators could see through Daniel's act. In fact, they said it was as if he was putting on a theater show for them. In the end, Daniel did confess, but figured he might try and act insane in order to get off with lesser charges. Money and insanity. Money and insanity. Okay. <laughs> In our seventh spot, we have patient number 18. Now, this has got to be one of the creepiest and mysterious clips on the internet. It's an interview featuring a man named Patient 18. This interview is filmed at a psychiatric hospital, and this man is there because he has schizophrenia. This tape is actually what schools use to teach their students about schizophrenia and the mind. But it's mysterious because we don't know much about this dude. Now, I just wanna say, having schizophrenia or mental health issues does not make this guy an evil person. He's on today's list because apparently at the hospital he admitted to taking someone's life. Plus, he has a history of criminal behavior. Upon doing more research, this might be a man named Stephen E. Anyways, take a look at this interview. And what happened that ended up with your being here in the hospital? The psychiatrist decided 
that this was the situation for me. Did he tell you why? No, the psychiatrist did not. Has anybody told you why? No. I got chills. I don't know about you. It's quite interesting how he carefully plans out his answers. Plus, no matter what they're talking about, he still shows no emotion. And in what way are you different? I am trying to do with my life something which few people try to do. And this influences my thinking and consequently my actions. He may seem calm on the outside, but what you can't imagine is everything that's going on in his head. You can tell he's trying hard to stay in control. As soon as I express the belief that I do not belong in this hospital, which is a mental hospital, then those who dislike me want to find a worse place for me. In our sixth spot, we have Alonzo Perez. In 2016, Alonzo Perez was charged for a series of crimes, including robbery with use of a deadly weapon, attempted murder with use of a deadly weapon, grand larceny, and battery. He was also arrested in connection with the death of Mohammed Robinson. This is footage of Alonzo inside of the interrogation cell waiting to be questioned. But not much of that actually happens as he manages to escape. First, we see him looking around at the cameras, and then he decides to forcibly remove his handcuffs. Now he does manage to get them off, but he's not ready to leave yet. He hasn't thought of a plan. So he pretends that his handcuffs are still on and he thinks of an escape plan. When he thinks of his plan, he gets up, climbs up, and escapes by crawling through the ceiling. He then drove away in a rental truck that someone left with the engine running. But don't worry, it was short-lived freedom because within days he was caught again and in more trouble. In the end though, he did plead guilty to three murders. We're now at our fifth and halfway mark with Andre Chikatilo. Andre Chikatilo otherwise known as the Butcher of Rostov or the Rostov Ripper, was responsible for the deaths of 56 individuals. He would lure people that he met at bus stops or train stations away to remote locations and then he would murder them. Sometimes he would even eat certain parts of his victims. In this interview, what shocks a lot of people is the fact that everyone expects him to act like a monster. But in fact, he acts quite the opposite. He seems innocent, which is either an act or, you know, his true personality. So he keeps up the innocent act saying how he feels sorry, blah, blah, blah. But the act drops when he is asked one question. Now the interview is in Russian, but I have the translation. So the interviewer asks him if he has ever thought about meeting his victims in heaven or hell. He answers with, and I quote, no, I have never thought about that. Never. I feel like it doesn't bother me. I have never thought about it. I have already passed all rounds of hell in my life. I am already ready to pass away to the other world again. That right there is creepy, not gonna lie. In our fourth spot we have David Berkowitz, but you probably better know him as the son of Sam. He was a serial killer who took the lives of six individuals and wounded seven others in New York City for more than a year. He would typically target good looking young women with long brown hair. As a result, a number of women were cutting their hair short or dyeing it blonde. He was eventually known as the son of Sam because he would leave letters near his victims bodies signing it off with that name. In the end, he was caught and claimed that his neighbors dog was possessed by a demon and that this demon dog was the one telling him to kill these people. Wild, I know. Well, years later, he did this interview. He admits to being into Satanism and how it influenced him. Yeah. I mean, when you talk about Satan, uh, what are you actually referring to? Well, um, you know, many people may uh, not really understand that, but at, at there was a time I was so confused and, and so troubled that um, I was seeking meaning and purpose. I was seeking uh, something. I, I don't know. My, as my life began to spin out of control, I mean, I got involved in like Satanism and I was reading the Satanic Bible. And he continues on talking about himself, but a lot of people believe he was just putting on an act the whole time. That he was trying to convince people that he's normal so that he would be released early. This is pretty common among serial killers. They love to manipulate people. How does it feel to be? here for, for 30 years knowing that this is going to be it. 
uh, you know, it's like you know the expression, take one day at a time, and uh, it's never easy, you know, being incarcerated. Uh, I have no one to blame but myself. In our third spot, we have Michael Beaver. In July of 2015, 16-year-old Michael Beaver and his 18-year-old brother Robert took the lives of their parents and three siblings. They first attacked their sister. When she screamed, their mother ran out of the bedroom and they stabbed her over 50 times. Eventually, they worked their way around the house, killing their family members. It's a very scary and graphic case. In this interview, Michael completely confesses to everything to an officer. So he was buying weapons because you guys had talked about murdering. Yeah, but then he started planning again. Okay. And that you didn't want to do it? I don't want to do it. I didn't, um, just because I didn't kill anyone. Okay. I stabbed someone. Who did you stab? Um, my younger brother, Christopher. Christopher? Yeah. How old is Christopher? Um, nine, I think. What did you stab him with? Um, my knife. What's your knife look like? There's literally no emotion in his voice. And for being so young, he doesn't seem affected by this at all. But here's the thing. This guy was obsessed with other killers, and the police officer noticed this and kept prying. Because um, you mentioned a couple names of, are those like serial killers or something? What, like Columbine? Yeah. Uh, Columbine and James Egan Holmes. James Egan Holmes is a guy that shot at the theater. In Colorado? Yeah, he killed 12. And, uh, wow. How many were killed in Columbine? Columbine? I don't know. Like, 15, okay. I think. He knew the killer's first and last names in their kill count. No one just knows that information off the top of their head, so that's creepy. In our second spot, we have the BTK killer. Between the years of 1974 to 1991, American serial killer Dennis Ratter took the lives of 10 individuals. In 2005, he was convicted for his crimes and was sentenced to 175 years in solitary confinement without the possibility of parole. This video is Dennis's confession to killing Marine Hedge. So I very carefully snuck into the house, kind of like a cat burglar, and after checking the house, she wasn't there. So about that time, the doors rattled, so I went, went back to one of the bedrooms and hid back there in one of the bedrooms. He then proceeded to talk about how he stayed in her house for hours until the next morning when he woke up and strangled her. No, I manually strangled her when she started to scream. So you but, used your hands? Yes, sir. And you strangled her? Did she die? Yes. It's chilling seeing him talk so casually about all of this. And in our number one spot today, we have Isi Sagawa. If you haven't heard of this case, then whoo, brace yourself because it's a very dark and gruesome one. In 1981, Isi Sagawa killed and ate a woman named Renee Hartfelt. Apparently, he always had a fantasy to eat a beautiful human. When he saw Renee, he knew she was the one. On June 11th, 1981, he invited her over, and then he shot her at the back of the neck, and then ate her over the next two days. That's not even the worst part. The worst part is that he was never convicted of his crimes. He literally spent two days in jail, then was sent back to Japan, and then he became a celebrity there. He was so famous that he made a living through the public's interest in his crime. Imagine that, literally becoming wealthy for killing someone. He's guilty, he's even admitted to it, but he never got penalized. Here are some disturbing moments from an interview with him. He continues on going into gruesome details about his murder and about another time that he attacked a different woman. I personally had a hard time sitting still watching this. It's just way too much. Moving on to number 9, we have Alan Leger. Alan Leger is a Canadian serial killer who on June 21st of 1986 entered a convenience store in Black River Bridge, New Brunswick with two other accomplices and robbed the joint. While doing so, they beat the store owner to death. But they were later caught and arrested. He was given a life sentence and sent to prison. However, in 1989, he managed to escape and was on the run for seven months. During this time, he killed four more innocent people. He also committed arson and a list of other crimes as well. Eventually, he was recaptured and is now spending the rest of his life in Canada's Maximum Security Special Handling Unit. Moving on to number eight, we have Rodney Halbauer. Ever since Rodney was young, he has been committing crimes. It started when he was only 16 years old. During his younger years, he was arrested and released on parole a number of times. But when released, he would commit 
more crimes, like theft. In 1975, Rodney was released on bail after taking advantage of a Las Vegas blackjack dealer. But while on bail, he took advantage of and killed six other women and received a life sentence. However, in 1977, he actually escaped jail and kidnapped his own daughter. Shortly after, he was recaptured only to escape again in 1986. While on the run, he stabbed and injured another woman. Thankfully, once again, he was recaptured. Wouldn't you think after the first time they would keep a closer eye on him? I guess not. In our seventh spot, we have Thomas Silverstein. Now this dude is said to be one of the most dangerous prisoners of all time and the most violent prisoner in America. He was first jailed in 1978 for armed robbery. While in jail, he killed a prison officer and two inmates. He also was the leader for the Aryan Brotherhood prison gang for quite some time. This prison gang is the largest and deadliest prison gang in the US with an estimated 20,000 members inside the prison and on the streets. Because of how many people he killed and injured in prison, Silverstein got transferred to a federal prison in Atlanta. There, he was confined in a six by seven foot cell. He was under 24 hour surveillance. In fact, the lights in his cell were never turned off so that they could always watch him. Silverstein eventually died in prison at the age of 67. In our sixth spot today, we have Victor Figueroa. On February 6th, 1997, Victor Figueroa managed to escape a Moroa shock incarceration facility in Mineville, New York. Victor had been serving a one to four year sentence for drug possession, but decided to take his chances and flee. When authorities noticed that he was missing, they searched the area, but all the leads ran cold. He has not been seen or heard from since. In fact, he's the only New York state prison inmate to escape and never be found. Either he's still out there or he died while trying to escape. Either way, it's a bit scary thinking that he could potentially still be out there. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with James Eddie Diggs. To the public, James Eddie Diggs seemed like a top-notch citizen. He seemed to be a great family man with a happy wife and two young sons. However, in the morning of May 26, 1949, he shot and killed his wife and kids before disappearing forever. Police did manage to find him a week later, but he managed to escape the officer by shooting him in the face and killing him. He since fled into the woods and hasn't been caught since. In fact, he was one of the FBI's 10 most wanted fugitives for the longest time, but he was eventually removed from the list in 1961 and is said to be dead by now. In our fourth spot, we have Robert Maudsley. Robert Maudsley is considered Britain's most dangerous prisoner, and you're about to find out why. In 1974, Maudsley was arrested for taking advantage of young individuals, but during his trial, he was found unfit and was sent to Broadmoor Hospital instead of a prison. While there, Maudsley and another patient locked themselves in a cell with another patient and held him hostage. While there, they tortured him to death over a period of nine hours. After this incident, he was convicted of manslaughter and was sent to Wakefield Prison. And there, he killed three inmates, after which he got placed in solitary confinement and spends his life in a glass cell underneath Wakefield Jail. In our third spot, we have George Edward Wright. In 1962, George Edward Wright was convicted for murder and was sentenced to up to 30 years in prison. Wright and three other men went on a spree of armed robbery, one in which they shot a man and took off with his money, which was only $70, so was it really worth it? Anyways, they were caught and put into jail. But then in 1970, Wright managed to escape from a prison in New Jersey. He was caught and locked up once again, only to escape once more in 1972. This time, he made sure he was never going to be caught again. So he came up with a plan. This plan involved hijacking a Delta Airlines flight and collecting ransom for the release of the passengers. Upon doing so, they flew the plane to Portugal. In 2011, the police caught up with him in Portugal, but since Portugal has no extradition treaty with the United States, Wright was released. He remains a fugitive to this day. Coming in at number two, we have Eric Rudolph. In 1996, Eric Rudolph bombed Atlanta's Centennial Olympic Park during the Summer Games. As a result, two individuals were killed and over 100 were injured. But that was just the beginning of his deadly bombing spree. He pulled off three more bombings, injuring hundreds more. For five years, the police were on a hunt for Eric. At one point, he was one of the top 10 fugitives on the FBI's list. It wasn't until 2003 that Eric got arrested. Turns out that he was hiding in the mountains for five years. Being a skilled outdoorsman, this helped him greatly. When he was caught, he pled guilty to all four bombings and was given four life sentences without the possibility of parole. He's now spending the rest of his life in the super prison in Florence, Colorado. And in our number one spot today, we have Santiago Maduros. In 2010, Santiago fired into a random person's car 
car because one of the passengers was wearing the wrong color jacket. The victim had no ties to any gang. He was just an innocent person riding in his sister's car. He was severely injured and his sister was unfortunately killed. A couple weeks later, Santiago and some of his friends were robbing a car. And when a group of men tried to stop them, he shot at them as well. He killed a random person that was just at the wrong place at the wrong time. From there, he was on the run for about a decade. Starting off this countdown, we have the Hitchhiker's Killer. The Hitchhiker's Killer is the name given to serial killer Donald Henry Gaskins. He started his killings in 1969 where he would pick up hitchhikers to later kill them. It's believed that he killed more than a dozen people. But even before he went on this killing spree, Gaskins had a history of sick crimes. Finally, on November 14th of 1975, Gaskins was arrested after a man witnessed him killing two men and called the police. He was later sentenced to death, but this sentence turned into life imprisonment without any possibility of parole. However, his killings did not stop while behind bars. While in prison, he became the only man to have ever killed an inmate on death row. In our ninth spot today, we have Glenn Stark Chambers. In January of 1975, Glenn Stark Chambers got into a heated dispute with his girlfriend, Connie Weeks. It ended with him taking her life. As a result, he was sentenced to death by electric chair, later reduced to life imprisonment. However, Glenn escaped prison on July 13th. Glenn, with two other inmates, ganged up to attack their detention officer and then escaped through a window. Now, he was captured three days later, but only to escape several years later. So he worked with the prison to help build furniture. He came up with a good idea to put himself into one of the boxes and have himself carried out of prison in a transport truck, and it worked. Even after three decades, Glenn has never been found. If he was still alive today, he would be in his 70s, so he could still be out there somewhere. In our eighth spot, we have Ted Bundy. Now, what was so scary about Ted Bundy is how smart he was. He was the definition of evil genius. So basically, he would use his smarts to manipulate women and then kill them. Bundy is said to be responsible for murdering 30 women, although it's thought that his number is much higher. Now, Bundy was actually able to escape custody multiple times. The first time, he jumped out of a second story building and fled while at the courthouse. He had planned this for days, practicing jumping from his top bed bunk in prison down to the floor to strengthen his ankles. Now, eventually he was caught, but then a while later, he escaped again. This time, he forced himself to lose weight in order to squeeze through a hole in his cell ceiling. When he did escape the second time, he went on to murder more women until being caught once again. In our seventh spot, we have Charles Manson. Infamous cult leader Charles Manson, who led the Manson family cult, had his followers commit crimes and murders on his behalf. Some of his members committed a series of nine murders in July and August of 1969. In 1971, Manson was convicted of first degree murder and conspiracy to commit murder for the deaths of seven people, including film actress Sharon Tate. What's scary about Manson is that he was also an evil genius. If you've ever seen his interviews, he actually acts quite wild and strange. People think that he's out of his mind. At one point, he was diagnosed with schizophrenia and paranoid delusion disorder. But some people think that he was just too smart for his own good and he was just faking all of this. In 1971, Manson received the death sentence, but a year later, the government got rid of capital punishment, so his sentence was changed to life in prison instead. In our sixth spot, we have Ian Brady and Myra Hindley. Between 1963 and 1965, Ian Brady and Myra Hindley worked together to torture, take advantage of, and kill a number of young individuals. What they did was incredibly messed up and it'll make your stomach churn. Now, these two were actually given the name the Moors Murderers because after taking the lives of their victims, they would bury their bodies on the Moors outside of Manchester. Both individuals were sentenced to life in prison for their crimes. Ian was actually placed in solitary confinement, whereas Myra died in prison in 2002. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with Lester Eubanks. In 1965, Lester was convicted of taking the life of Mary Ellen Diener. As a result, he was given the death penalty, which later got changed to a life sentence. Now, over the years in prison, apparently Lester changed his ways and became very well behaved. In fact, on December 7th, 1973, they let him go out to Christmas shop for his family. While out in a mall, he managed to escape his guards and flee. To this day, he still hasn't been caught. He's out there somewhere in hiding. 
who knows where he fled to or what he's up to now. Coming in at number four, we have Robert William Fisher. Now, this guy is one of the FBI's most wanted fugitives. He is on the run after a triple homicide and arson. On April 9th, 2001, Fisher took the lives of his wife and two children before blowing up their house. It is still unclear as to why he did this, and he's been on the run ever since. And please have no leads. On April 20th, his car was found in a forest near Payson, Arizona, but Robert was nowhere to be found. On November 3rd, 2021, Fisher was removed from the FBI's most wanted fugitives list. But despite them doing this, he still remains a very wanted fugitive. In our third spot, we have Bradford Bishop. Bradford Bishop Jr. is a former United States Foreign Service officer who is now a wanted fugitive. On March 1st of 1976, Bishop started to spiral after not receiving the promotion he really wanted. He then left his work early, drove to the bank, withdrew money, and then bought a sledgehammer, gas can, shovel, and pitchfork. He then returned home where he killed his wife, mother, and three sons. He then drove the body several miles away way before burying them in a wooded swamp area before setting them on fire. As a result, he was placed on the FBI's list of 10 most wanted fugitives. They have no clue as to where Bishop is now. He could be anywhere, but they do believe that he fled to Europe. Moving on to number two, we have Arthur Hutchinson. Arthur Hutchinson has lived a life of crime for murder, attempted murder, theft, and burglary. In fact, he spent five years in prison for the attempted murder of his half-brother. In September of 1983, he was brought into a police station after being arrested for theft. While there, he asked to go to the bathroom and then proceeded to jump out of the bathroom window and fled. He was on the run for three and a half weeks. While on the run, he crashed a wedding and murdered the bride's father, mother, and brother. Later that day, he broke into another person's home and stabbed all three of the residents to death. He was finally caught on November 5th of 1983 and sentenced to life imprisonment. And in our number one spot today, we have Ahmed Suraji. From 1986 to 1997, Ahmed took the lives of 42 females. The bodies of his victims were found in a sugarcane field. What he would do was after killing them, he would bury them waist deep in his field with their heads facing his house. He believed that by doing so, this gave him great power. But he was later caught and arrested alongside his sisters and three wives who helped him. One of his wives was actually actually sentenced to death, but that was later changed to life imprisonment. Ahmed, on the other hand, was sentenced to death by a firing squad in 2008. Starting off this countdown, we have Donald Harvey, aka the Angel of Death. Donald Harvey is a nurse turned serial killer. So he was working in a hospital as a nurse and was secretly killing off his patients. To him, he was doing them a favor. He thought that his chronically ill patients needed a relief from the pain. So he would smother them with pillows or would poison them or let their oxygen tanks run out. It's believed that he took the lives of over 70 people. However, in 1987, he was only convicted for 37 counts of murder. He was sentenced to life plus 20 years. In March of 2017, Harvey was beat up badly by a fellow inmate. He passed away shortly after. In our ninth spot, we have Albert DeSalvo. Albert DeSalvo, better known as the Boston Strangler, took the lives of 13 women between 1962 and 1964. He would strangle these women with a piece of their clothing before taking advantage of them. In January of 1960, he was sentenced to life imprisonment. A month later, him and two other inmates actually managed to escape from prison and a full-scale manhunt ensued. Thankfully, it wasn't long until he was recaptured. However, in 1973, Albert was stabbed to death by another prisoner. In our eighth spot, we have Ronnie McPeters. Now, Ronnie McPeters has actually been deemed too insane to execute. So Ronnie was first arrested after taking the life of a 27 year old woman. The woman, Linda Marie Baltazar, was running errands when Ronnie came up to her window while panhandling. She shooed him away and he left, but he ended up coming back and shooting her. He was first placed in jail for his crime and then placed in the rubber room. But that didn't stop him because he was known to set fires in the jail and harass other inmates. So they moved him to San Quentin prison where he was awaiting death row. And that's when he started acting even crazier. Apparently he would attack other prisoners and guards and was known to smear his feces all over his cell and even himself. This behavior got him off of death row. They literally thought that he was far too troubled to be executed. In our seventh spot, we have Mark Chopper Reed. Mark Reed is an Australian criminal who lived a life of crime. 
He was known to rip off drug dealers as well as he would kidnap and torture members of the criminal underworld. It's believed that he was responsible for the death of 19 people and the attempted murder of 11 others. In fact, the movie Chopper is based off of his life and it's a wild movie. The things he would do were insane. For example, he had a fellow inmate cut both of his ears off so that he could leave H Division and be transferred to a different wing. He also once played Russian roulette with himself. Who does that for fun? In our sixth spot today, we have Jeffrey Dahmer. Jeffrey Dahmer is one of the most famous serial killers in the world. People all around the world know of him and the sadistic and disturbing crimes that he committed. From 1978 to 1991, Jeffrey murdered and dismembered 17 male individuals. What he did afterwards was even more disturbing. He would keep some of the body parts as souvenirs, even take photographs of the deceased. When police searched his home, they found it littered with human remains. Dahmer was finally arrested on July 22nd of 1991. However, while in prison, there were multiple attempts on his life. On November 28th, 1994, an inmate, Christopher Scarver, finally succeeded at taking Dahmer's life. His reasoning behind this? Well, apparently Dahmer was known to taunt others in prison. He would do this by making his prison food look like severed limbs to taunt the other people. He would even drizzle ketchup on top of his blood. Christopher and others found this very unnerving, so he decided to take action against him and beat him to death. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with Jason Barnum, aka better known as Eyeball Man. And that's because he literally has a tattoo on his eyeball, like he tattooed it completely black. If that doesn't speak volumes about who he is, then I don't know what does. He also has one side of his face tattooed to look like a skull. So not only does this dude look like a scary prisoner, but he is one. This dude has a long list of crimes under his belt, including possession of heroin, first degree attempted murder, first degree burglary, and third degree felony in possession of a weapon. In fact, he was sentenced to 22 years in jail after shooting a police officer. Moving on to number four, we have Nico Jenkins. This guy is one of the scariest inmates in the world. Some say he's the craziest inmate in the world, and you're about to find out why. One time, he killed a man just because he stared at him the wrong way. Not only that, but in court, Jenkins was known to speak in some weird language. He said he used this language to communicate with an Egyptian serpent god. And this god was the one giving him orders to kill people. He also enjoyed talking about the people he killed and smiled the whole time while doing so. In the end, he was convicted for killing four individuals. Moving on to number three, we have Damien Folks. In 2002, Damien Folks was sentenced to 12 years for a series of armed robberies that he had committed. But while in jail, he committed even more crimes. In 2010, he attempted to kill another prison inmate. He made a DIY shank by melting a razor blade onto plastic cutlery, and he used it to slice a guy's throat. As a result, he was transferred to a higher security prison but that did not stop him. A year later, he killed an inmate by strangling him to death with strips of his bedding. These attacks gained him the title of being an extremely dangerous prisoner. In our second spot today, we have Alexander Pikushkin. Alexander is a Russian serial killer who wanted to complete the number of squares on a chessboard by killing 64 people. It's said that he has killed around at least 49 individuals and possibly as many as 60. In fact, he was inspired by another serial killer, Andrei Chikatilo, who I have talked about before. In his mind, he wanted to compete with him and kill even more individuals than Andre did. Now, what I find the weirdest is when Alexander was young, he was said to be such a kind and sociable child. That was until one day when he got struck in the head by a swing. From then on, his whole demeanor completely changed and he got really aggressive. So they think that this accident turned him into a serial killer. And in our number one spot today, we have Pedro Rodriguez Filho, AKA the Brazilian maniac. This guy is a Brazilian serial killer who claims to have taken the lives of 100 individuals. He started killing at a young age, one of the first kills being his father. He apparently killed his father with a machete, cut out his heart, and then chewed on it. He also has been known to kill and torture a number of gang members. He did this all before he was 18. He was arrested on May 24th of 1973, during which he was placed in a car with another criminal who he killed for no reason. 
And while in prison, he went on to kill more people. It's said that he took the lives of 47 inmates in jail alone. Pedro served 42 years in prison before his release in 2018. Yes, he killed that many people and then he got released. Starting off this countdown, we have Gary Ridgway. Gary Ridgway, otherwise known as the Green River Killer, took the lives of 48 women between 1980 to 1990. But it's believed that his number may be as high as 71 people. He gets his name due to the fact that he would dump the bodies along riverbanks in South King County. In 2001, he was arrested. After his conviction, he did an interview where he talked all about his murders and how he had the desire to kill ever since he was little. But I took my aggression on, I couldn't take it on my mom, I had to take it on my animals. and. As stated in the interview, he confessed that he started killing at a young age. He had this built up anger towards his mom, but he couldn't harm her, so he would harm animals instead. Living things? Living things, killing, killing animals. Okay. Killing animals. Um. In this interview, he went on to talk more about his victims in detail. Hearing someone confess to murder is just very, very disturbing. In our ninth spot, we have John Hughes. But before I go any further, make sure to hit that thumbs up button because it really helps us out. I don't think like normal people, never have. I have racing thoughts, it's been that way since I was a kid. I'm constantly, it doesn't matter if I'm sleeping, if I'm awake, I'm constantly thinking of a hundred things at one time. John Hughes considers himself the Antichrist. He was arrested back in 2008 after killing a trucker at a rest stop along Interstate 29. This dude is intense and incredibly scary. He claims to have killed 15 to 20 people, but that hasn't been confirmed yet. Either way, in this interview for KMBC News, Lara Moretz gets the chance to interview him. And he talks about the people he has taken the lives of and why he did this. Rest area, and that was a way for me to gain control, to, to show, I don't know, I guess I assert my dominance, I guess you could say. That'd be the way to put it. And it shut everybody up for a while. The scariest part of the interview is when Lara asks if he feels bad about killing people. And this was his response. I don't feel bad about killing uh, anyone. Not personally, that I've personally done myself, no. I just view things as objects, people, animals, the trees, cars, they're just all the same to me. So no, he feels no remorse. In our eighth spot, we have Jose Martinez. Explanation because I want to get them. I didn't want the cops to find them. I want to find them myself. We went to this little house. We broke in there and we find one, I shot him. This dude is one you never want to mess with. And he reveals why during his interview. Basically, Jose was a hitman for a drug cartel. He admitted to killing three dozen people as a hitman and dozens of others just on his own, many of whom were people that just pissed him off. For example, in this interview, he talks about one of his brother-in-law's friends. Whenever the friend would visit, he would tell him to park on the side of the road, not on his driveway. He told him this a number of times, yet he still continued to park on the driveway. So what did he do? He asked the guy to take him for a ride in his truck. He then shot him, just to teach him a lesson. I told him, then I told you not to park in my driveway. And he said he didn't listen to nobody except his mother. Okay. okay. Moving on to number six, we have Otis Toole. Otis Toole, or the Jacksonville Cannibal, is a serial killer convicted of six counts of murder. He's most famous for killing the son of American's most wanted host, John Walsh. In an interview from 1993, we see how dark and twisted Toole really is. He would talk about his dark desires, like watching an entire city burn. He then went on to justify his killings, saying that taking someone's life is no different than stepping on a bug or eating animal meat. There's way more disturbing stuff that he discusses, but it's just too much to talk about on YouTube. Like he goes into depth about his killings. It's way too much to hear. We're now at our fifth and halfway mark with Joel Rifkin. Tragedy happens in lives. Unfortunately, it was their lives. The world wouldn't know his name until after his killing spree had ended. Now, in a rare prison interview, serial killer Joel Rifkin talks about his sickening crimes down to the smallest detail. 
Joel Rifkin was an American serial killer responsible for taking the lives of 17 women in the 1990s. He was caught in 1993 when cops pulled him over for a missing license plate. But to their horrors, they found his latest victim in his trunk. He was then sentenced to 203 years in prison. In this interview, Joel just seems so proud of himself when he's recalling his crimes. He also talks about the police's interrogation process and why he confessed to the crimes. The most disturbing thing though is when he admits to keeping trophies from each of his victims. He said he did this so that he could remember each victim and what he did to them. As the numbers started to increase, an ID would, you know, okay, that has a photo, I know I know who that girl was, uh, or a piece of jewelry, okay, I know that it's from that girl. In our fourth spot, we have Israel Keys. Israel Keys started his killings in 1996 and continued on until March of 2012 when he was finally arrested. He was known for traveling to a number of locations to commit his crimes. Then he would rob banks and homes so that he could afford to travel to kill. In this interview, we see him talk about his killings and how he selected his victims. When I was smart, I would let them come to me. This remote area. People just found it gross how calmly he talks about this all while eating a bagel and drinking. He continued on saying what his strategy was, and that was to grab people in remote locations like parks and campgrounds, even cemeteries. You might not get exactly what you're, there's not much to choose from in a manner of speaking, but there's also no witnesses really, there's no one else around. In our third spot we have Chris Watts. If you've seen the Netflix documentary on Chris Watts and his family, then you know how messed up this whole story is. Chris is guilty of killing his wife and their two daughters. When he was brought into questioning, he denied having anything to do with this. But after failing the polygraph test, the police started nailing him hard. That's when he came up with this elaborate lie about what happened. After that, I mean, It's crazy seeing him put on this whole show and turning his wife into a criminal, saying she was the one that hurt their daughters and then he hurt her as a result. In the end, the officers saw right through his fabricated story. But still, it's crazy. Moving on to number two, we have Richard Kuklinski. I could get over on you, or get you to do what I wanted you to do, is to hurt your family. Richard started killing at a very young age. He committed his first murder when he was just 13 years old. Over the span of his career, he took the lives of around 200 people. Could even be more. I mean, he would often kill homeless people just for fun. On top of that, he worked as a hitman for the mafia. So yeah, his count is pretty high. It was revealed that any person who was ever deemed his friend was eventually killed off by him. In 1988, he was caught by an undercover cop and sent to prison. In this interview, it is truly disturbing to see the lack of remorse he has. Listen to him talk about him shooting a guy. And I went pop, 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 and then I went pop, pop. And I could see the material moving on in the, on his jacket as these things. Actually, they made little marks on it. They, on the jacket, I guess they were burn marks. I think the scariest part was all of a sudden during the interview, he gets this messed up smile on his face and just stares at the interviewer for an uncomfortable amount of time. I legit got uncomfortable for the interviewer. And then after that long, unbearable pause, he starts asking the interviewer questions. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> What do you think about me? Anything good, bad, or indifferent? It just made me cringe. It's so bad. And 
And in our number one spot, we have Zachary Davis. This interview gave me the chills. It makes me so uncomfortable. So this is the interview of Zachary Davis. In August of 2012, he took his mother's life before trying to set his house on fire with his brother inside. Now, Zachary has been diagnosed with a number of mental illnesses, including schizophrenia and depressive disorder. In 2007, when he was nine years old, his father passed away from ALS, and that apparently started this all. He just spiraled out of control and became withdrawn. He even had an app on his phone about serial killers, and in his notebooks, he would write about disturbing things, like you can can't spell slaughter without laughter. The creepiest part of this interview is when Dr. Phil asks him about the murder weapon, which was a sledgehammer. At one point while discussing it, he literally smiles as if he's proud of what he did. That sent shivers down my spine. It is terrifying. Number 10, Tomas de Torquemada. Ever heard of the Spanish Inquisition? Well, this guy was one of its star killers. Not only do we wish it never happened in the first place, it did, so we might as well talk about it and learn from it. But we can't discuss the Inquisition without mentioning Tomas, who was responsible for thousands of deaths. He gave people two choices, either join the Catholic Church or die, which led to thousands of Jewish and Islamic people being exiled from Spain. He played the role of inquisitor and was in charge of investigating and punishing heretics. He oversaw the burning of thousands of innocent people, as Tomas often used cruel methods of extracting confessions from people he believed to be heretics. He seemed to almost enjoy his job hanging, burning, suffocating, and tormenting people with the rack and waterboarding. No one knows exactly how many people died during the Inquisition, but historians estimate anywhere between 30,000 to 300,000. Pretty, pretty wide gap there. Number nine, Caligula. Man, his name is too fun to say. Too bad he wasn't a fun guy. It's better I tell you now that essentially this list is a depiction of what happens when the wrong people get their hands on power. From 37 AD to 41 AD, Caligula ruled as if he was some kind of mad god that needed to be satisfied. Not only did his addiction to gambling cause a nightmare for the economy, he seemed to delight in suffering. In the first three months of his rule, he made his people sacrifice 160,000 animals in his name. When he first took over as ruler, people actually liked him though. He made helpful political reforms and were called exiles, but most people blame his future tyranny on a brain fever that befell him later on. He blew money on lavish projects, some still helpful like aqueducts, to building a two mile long floating bridge across the Bay of Bali so he could ride his horse across it day after day. He even ordered his men to attack the sea by collecting shells with their helmets. His lascivious love affairs included copulating with the wives of his allies and even allegedly his own sisters. Caligula's reign was equal parts terrifying and embarrassing, which is probably why his officers stabbed him to death. Number eight, Leopold II of Belgium. During the height of colonialism, Leopold of Belgium wanted to make his mark by conquering the African Congo. As soon as I said colonialism, you know, you know where things are going, so get ready. He made it his property and instead of, you know, being a good human being, he decided to establish a dictatorship instead. He made the rest of Europe think that he was acting as a good guy, so they'd give him money, then proceeded to hire mercenaries. These mercenaries were set with the task of draining as much money from the state by enforcing free labor camps. Anyone who disobeyed or failed to meet demands were severely punished and even had their limbs removed. Leopold was responsible for the deaths of 20% of the population and thankfully was stopped before he could do more damage. Roger Caseman, after doing a little digging, released a report which detailed the horrors he had committed under the guise of philanthropy. He was forced to surrender the Congo, though it was considered a part of Belgium until the 1950s. <sighs> Whew, buckle up folks, it only gets worse from here. It's number seven and we're already at Genghis Khan. Get ready. Genghis Khan, ruler of the Mongolian Empire, killed so many people. He changed the carbon footprint of the earth. In one single battle, he killed over 1.2 million people. Though this sounds like an exaggeration, I don't find it hard to believe, since he just left the corpses to rot, the battlefields became oily and whole mounds of, like, mountains of bodies formed. Genghis Khan was supposedly responsible for over 40 million deaths. If you need a number to compare that to, that's the same amount of people who died in World War I altogether. He also enjoyed in excess the spoils of war, brutalizing women and assaulting them. In addition to that, he held mass beauty contests and all those who didn't win would be given to his soldiers, like, objects. 
Mm. Because of that, around 16 million people are said to be descendants of him today. That's how many people he... Yeah. Many people blame his brutal and ruthless upbringing as Khan very much had to raise himself under the mentality to kill or be killed. He even killed his own brother at age 10 just for not sharing food. He was also horrendous when it came to tormenting his betrayers. Some ways include pouring molten silver down their throats and sawing people in half while they were still alive. Oh, and he killed 75% of the population of Iran and tried to commit an entire genocide. Yeah, the list goes on, but so does this list and there is more to come, so... Let's go. Number six, Talat Pasha. Pasha was the Grand Vizier to the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire in the early 20th century and was the main architect of the Armenian Genocide. When Armenian families were evicted from their homes in 1915, his signature was on the orders. On April 24th, they executed several hundred intellectuals in order to begin Turkifying the country. Many were sent through the Mesopotamian desert on death marches without food or water after being stripped naked so the sun would just boil them alive. Anyone who stopped walking was shot. He also created a special organization made of killers and ex-convicts who were ordered to carry out the liquidation of the Christian elements. They drowned people in rivers, threw civilians off cliffs, even crucified and burned people alive. Yep, this happened in the 1900s, by the way. So there are about 600,000 to 1.5 million reasons we wish this man never existed because that is how many people Pasha was responsible for killing. Ooh, man. Number five, Idi Amin. General Idi Amin staged a coup on January 25th, 1971 and forced Uganda's first prime minister, Milton Oboe, into exile. From there, he created a reign of terror that abused Uganda's freedom after more than 70 years of British rule. Amin organized mass executions of Akoli and Lango Christian tribes who were loyal to Oboe. He terrorized his own country with internal security forces whose main purpose was to eliminate those who opposed him. His brutality also resulted in the collapse of the economy, this man just seemed like he just didn't have a single good bone in his body. He was also rumored to have eaten human flesh and his vicious and inhumane rule resulted in the death of 300,000 civilians. Eventually Amin was forced to flee and sought refuge in Saudi Arabia, though he was never punished for his crimes and died in 2003 due to organ failure. So he got away with it, essentially. Number 4, Pol Pot. Hmm. You'd think a leader's job would be to protect and serve their country with love and respect, but I guess Pol Pot didn't see it that way. Originally named Salah Sar, Pot was the leader of the Khmer Rouge totalitarian regime during 1975-79 to in Cambodia, though technically longer. It was a radical communist government who caused the death of more than 2 million people through forced labor, starvation, disease, torment, persecution, and execution. He wanted to purify society and wanted to extinguish capitalism, western culture, city life, religion, and all foreign influences in order to form a pure communist regime. All media outlets along with embassies and external medical help were refused and essentially he barricaded Cambodia into their own little world. Education was halted, healthcare eliminated, it was crazy. The people were forced into slave labor on the killing fields, only allowed 180 grams of rice a day. Deadly purges were conducted to eliminate remnants of the old society including monks, police, doctors, lawyers, teachers, ex-soldiers along with their families and former government officials. His cruelty and madness knew no bounds. It took years for him to finally be put under house arrest by his peers and was never truly punished for his crimes against humanity. He died of a heart attack in 1998 following his arrest. So yeah. And we're reaching our top three. <laughs> I bet you thought, I bet you thought number three was going to be number one. Nope, there were worse people than him, believe it or not. Number three, we have Adolf. I can't say his last name because apparently YouTube won't let me, which is ridiculous. So he's not Voldemort, but you know who I'm talking about, that really evil German guy. Yeah. I don't really need to go into detail here unless you don't know about one of the most infamous genocides to take place in all of history. Along with the amount of people Adolf's army killed in World War II, his warped and disgusting worldview resulted in the destruction of more than 6 million lives, mainly those of Jewish descent but LGBTQ, political prisoners, and basically anyone he and his followers deemed a lesser human. He was the personification of hatred and led the world into one of the most deadly wars to date. We should also give a shout out to all of his henchmen 
henchmen who served underneath him, all working together to enact one of the cruelest moments in history. If he hadn't been born, who knows if it would have happened anyways due to political and social tensions at the time, but maybe, just maybe, it wouldn't have happened at all, and all those lives would still be around today. Number two, guys, like I knew he was bad, but dug deep today, dug deep today, and I did not, I would never, never thought I would say this, but number two, Joseph Stalin. Joseph Stalin made his own henchman disappear in photos, and boy do we wish it was him instead. Stalin was the premier of the Soviet Union and was responsible for the deaths of more than 20 million, 20 million of his own people, double that if you count World War II. He ruled for 30 years and ruled with an iron fist, eliminating anyone who opposed him, and as you can guess, there were many. In 1927 and 1929, he had one million people exiled or imprisoned, 9 to 11 million were forced off their lands, and 3 million peasants were arrested or exiled in the mass collectivization program. 6 to 7 million were killed by artificial famine in the 1930s. During 1936 to 1938, he executed approximately 750,000 during the Great Terror, a brutal political campaign to remove dissenters and any others he considered a threat. He was so paranoid. This guy had no regard for human life whatsoever. While the world was focused on Adolf, he was doing all of this, and he was fighting on the Allies' side. Though we started supporting Hitler, and then he came onto our side. Anyways, mm. it is estimated that Stalin orchestrated the deaths of 60 million people, which means about 40,000 people died every week during his raid. Need I say more? And if you think that's bad, number one spot, Mao Zedong. Ready? I don't think anyone can be. Mao Zedong during 1966 to 1976 turned China into a house of fear by eradicating 65 million people. In his attempt for a socialist China, he killed anyone that got in his way, kind of like Stalin, through execution and mass starvation. His biggest threat was the intellect. And revered Emperor Shi Huang, who buried 460 scholars and sought to surpass him by burying alive 46,000 scholars. Yeah, my stomach turned when I read that. That's awful. He coined his operation the Great Leap Forward. To combat rising resistance, he created the Red Army, composed of girls and boys from the ages of 14 to 21, to roam cities and target enemies of the state, especially their teachers. He would make the teachers wear dunce hats, cover their faces with ink, and make them crawl on all fours and bark like dogs. He also expanded a system of a thousand forced labor camps. Most amazing fam, I could go on, but I honestly don't have room. It just seems like there's no end to all the awful things that he did. For all these reasons and more, Mao is of course in our number one spot. Coming in at number 7, we have Vlad the Impaler. Vlad the Impaler was the inspiration behind the legend of Dracula, and like his fictitious counterpart, he was a very bloodthirsty chap. Vlad was alive for a mere 45 years, between 1431 and 1476, but in that time it is estimated that he could have killed around 1,000 people. Vlad was Prince of Wallachia, a historic region of Romania, and to cut a really long story short, he killed everybody body that stood in his way of power or threatened his position. He plundered villages and killed armies. How did he kill them? Well, he's not called Vlad the Impaler by accident. He really liked to impale his victims and then proudly display their corpses. He also impaled animals and nailed turbans to the heads of Turkish messengers. He was known to be cruel and wicked within his lifetime, with news of his evil soul becoming a popular story in German courts. Coming in at number 4, we have Delphine. Lalori. Considered one of the most evil women in the world, let alone New Orleans, this absolute historic she devil even got her own character on American Horror Story. Delphine grew up as a young, rich beauty in a wealthy white Creole family in New Orleans. After three marriages, she brought her own home and installed a slave's quarter in the top floor. Beneath the shiny veneer of her lavishly furnished home, Delphine had a sick secret. The slaves' quarters were actually a secret torture and murder room. She woefully mistreated her staff, but the extent of the horror wasn't known until a fire broke out in her home. 
The fire marshal searched the top floor only to find a dozen people chained up with others in cages. Body parts and severed heads sat in buckets and organs were strewn across the floor. Delphine never faced justice as she fled to Paris. A recent evil up next at number 3 we have Harold Shipman. Harold Shipman was a British doctor who broke the Hippocratic Oath and abused his power to carry out 218 or more sick murders. Shipman killed people by administering them with a lethal dose of diamorphine and then he used his position as a doctor to sign their death certificates and also to doctor their medical records to suggest that they were in bad health. 80% of his victims were women, usually over the age of 50, however Shipman has been linked to the death of a 4 year old. His last victim was pensioner Kathleen Grundy, for whom he had forged a will, leaving himself in excess of £300,000. Eventually he was discovered and sent to prison in 2000, and in 2004 he hung himself on his 58th birthday, reportedly waiting this long specifically so his wife would get his £100,000 pension. Sick. Number 10, Lionel Tate. Starting off our list, we have Lionel Tate. It was 2001 and Lionel was play fighting with another friend, so he says. She was actually a neighbor, and at just 13 years old, Lionel did something that day that made him one of the youngest criminals in history to ever receive a life sentence. He was 13 years old. He was barely a teenager. He had to receive a life sentence because he had taken these pro wrestling moves, as he calls them, too far. He had told authorities it was an accident but it was very clear that she had been attacked brutally. It was awful. Her wounds were sadly fateful, which of course led to the life sentence of one Lionel Tate. Now in 2010, it was ruled unconstitutional for teens to receive life sentences unless it was murder. This is obviously cause for debate. Number 9, Brian Lee Draper. This one's actually two criminals for the price of none. Brian Lee Draper and his partner, Tori Adamick, both were sentenced to life at just 16 years old. It was disgusting and vile to say the least. They both planned this horrific attack. They hid in their classmate's closet and then they both violently attacked her. She had 29 stab wounds. Cassie Jo Stoddard was killed because two 16 year olds hid in her house and then cut the power. That's terrifying. I cannot imagine how scary that must have been. Reminder, both of them are serving life sentences. It doesn't feel like enough almost, you know what I mean? Like you read about her injuries and what happened and the whole incident. One life sentence doesn't feel like enough in this case. So I get it. A lot of these cases people get six life sentences. I'm like, yep, more than fair. Number eight, Eric Smith. We go back now to 1993. I wasn't even born yet, but Eric Smith, he was 13 years old and he couldn't contain his rage towards another youngin. Now Eric himself was bullied growing up, he didn't get along with anybody, and one day he decided to attack somebody violently with a rock. He had lured them into the woods first away from the park, and then just like that, that was it. Smith is of course a lot older now, and in total he's been denied parole eight times. Yeah, probably nine by the time this video goes out, realistically. I hope he never gets out. I don't know. This is something I don't think you can bounce back from, to be honest with you. That's uh that's some Michael Myers sh if I'm being honest. Number seven, Kenneth Young. His last name is literally Young. It's quite ironic and also extremely brutal, this one. Young was 15 years old and he was faced with a situation that nobody should have to face, let alone face it at such an early age. Kenneth Young was threatened by a narcotics dealer. He forced Kenneth to partake in his illegal dealings, specifically that of an armed robbery, or else he would take Kenneth's mother and he would hurt her. Now, Kenneth did what he was asked, rather did what he was forced to do, but one night when said dealer was a woman, Kenneth attacked the dealer and in turn he received four concurrent sentences of 30 years. Now the dealer in question, he was 24 and he forced Kenneth to be involved in three armed robberies and one attempted armed robbery, all in a 30 day period. That dealer only received a single life sentence. Yeah, not all these are the best judgments I would say. Number six, Evan Miller. It was 2003. The Alabama prisoner was only 14 years old at the time when he was sentenced to life after killing Cole Cannon. During the pandemic, Evan Miller was actually resentenced to life without parole. The judge considered Miller's early exposure to violence and abuse. But ultimately the judge concluded with quote, the crime is why we are here. We are not here because Mr. Miller shuddered at the hands of his father, end quote. 
fair. You gotta keep it in the lane that you're operating in. Given that Miller was found the principal aggressor, that ship has sailed. Now before I continue, I wanna do a quick shout out to our history channel, Bumblebee. We do a lot of top tens over there as well, but it's all Victorian criminals, gladiator history, those really long pointed shoes that some people would wear, dark stuff like that. It's a great time. Bumblebee, go check it out after we're done here. I'll see you there myself. Number five, Bobby Bostick. It was a rough go for Bobby his entire life, and by age 10, he was partaking in illegal narcotics. By age 13, he was stealing cars, and while still on copious amounts of said narcotics, come December 1995, Bobby Bostick was only 16, and he was at a friend's house. Everybody was involved in all these illegal substances, just, you know, stuff you shouldn't be consuming at a young age, and Bobby got into an altercation with another female at the same house. Bobby was 16 when he was found guilty of 17 different horrible crimes that took place that night. All consecutive sentences also, which is a horrible sign. Bobby, as of right now, is set to live in prison until January 2091. Yeah, he will be 112 by time that sentence is up, so. Yeah, he probably won't ever get out. Number four, Frederick Prichet. On November 29th, 2012, Prichet was only 17 years old, which at this point is kind of old in this list, you would say. He was just 17 when he was sentenced to 55 years in prison for armed robbery and kidnapping and motor vehicle theft. That's a nasty three right there. But things get even worse, dare I say. Cut to less than a month later, Frederick Prichet was charged with aggravated assault on a law enforcement officer and robbery involving an incident while still in custody. Can you believe that? This all happened after he had received 55 years at the Lauderdale County Detention Center. All of a sudden, a correctional officer hands a cup of water to Prichette, and that's when he grabbed her arm, put his arm around her neck, and then held her for about two minutes before ultimately releasing her. Her cell phone was also later found in his cell. So it comes to no surprise that he was convicted again for these acts, and this time around, he was given an additional 45 years, so he won't be released until 2111. I'm not even gonna say the years. 2111, that sounds like it's so far away. 2111, no way, 2111? No, they all sound so fake and weird. They all sound so wrong. I remember when like 1999 was like, all right, that's cool. 2002, you're like, yeah. Yeah, it's 2111, you're like, Jesus, slow down, what? That's so many numbers. Number three, John Chabelle. Back in 1994, John Chabelle was only 17 years old and he managed to get sentenced to a total of 95 years in prison without the possibility of parole. Big yikes. See, Bell was convicted of armed robbery, burglary, and two counts of kidnapping. Again, that is a nasty bundle of offenses. And the worst part about all of this, he was sentenced as a habitual offender, meaning that chances of getting out are now slim to none. Jake Howard, an attorney with the MacArthur Justice Center in Mississippi, he argues that, quote, Mr. Bell's aggregated sentence guarantees that he will die in prison, end quote. Now, as we near the end of our list today, I have to ask, do you agree with these sentences so far? Do you think being locked up until you're 113 years old is a fair punishment ever? Or do you believe that people have the opportunity to change? Comment down below. Obviously, it you know depends which case, but it's tough. Number two, Stephen Thomas. Stephen Thomas pleaded guilty in 2007 in Madison County Circuit to kidnapping, forcible sexual and armed robbery. Again, horrible stuff. Thomas was only 17 at the time and he was sentenced to 70 years. Thomas later asked the court for an evidentiary hearing in his case and argued that his sentence was cruel and an unusual punishment and the court denied his petition. So he will be there until the absolute rest of his life. And finally, number one, Edward Lamont Neal. Now forced to serve 95 years behind bars, Edward Lamont Neal committed, as you would have guessed, a handful of horrific crimes. He was initially sentenced to five years for that initial offense, and then not soon after, got five years for jail escape in Lowndes County. Now you doubled your sentence, all because you watched the Shawshank Redemption and you felt inspired. You wanted to make a run for it. It's not worth it. But he was later convicted of burglary on an unoccupied dwelling. Not great. And he was subsequently given 25 more years in prison. Later, in a separate case, Edward Lamont Neal was given 60 years as a habitual offender after being convicted for armed robbery and aggravated as So he won't be out until 2098. In other words, he won't be out. Probably not ever, unless a skeleton walked out of the jail, and that's the only way we'd see him walk out. Starting off this countdown, we have Richard Matt. 
Matt's career as a criminal started off when he was young. He was involved in robberies, kidnappings, and then eventually murder. The first murder he committed was of his former boss. He then fled to Mexico to avoid being caught. While there, he murdered a second man while attempting to rob him. In 2007, he was convicted for the murders and began serving a 25 year to life sentence. But guess what? 2015, he actually escaped the facility with a fellow inmate, and they spent 20 days on the run before getting recaught. And apparently, he has a history of jailbreaks. So I don't know why they just didn't pay closer attention to him. In the end, this was his final escape since he was caught and killed by Border Patrol while trying to flee to Canada. In our ninth spot, we have the dating game killer. This dude gets his name because while police were looking for him, he appeared on TV for an episode of the dating game in 1978. He did this in the midst of his murder spree. In fact, the dater on the show actually chose him, but when they met afterwards, she said that she got a bad feeling around him and they never actually went on a date, which that was a close call for her. Because during his appearance on the show, he had already murdered at least 5 women. His date would have probably been his next victim. This killer would often toy with his victims. He would strangle them until they lost consciousness, then he would revive them and then repeat this process several times before taking their lives. In the end, he was convicted of murdering 5 women, but police think that his kill count is much, much higher. In our 8th spot, we have the razor blade. This story comes from a prisoner who was locked away in a Texas prison. The prisoner told the story of a fellow inmate who everyone feared. It was this woman who would violently lash out on her fellow inmates. One time, she even put a razor blade in a bar of soap and would use it to cut up other prisoners. When the guards found them, there was blood everywhere. So yeah, I can see why people fear her. I wouldn't want to get on her bad side, let alone even look at her. Moving on to number 7, we have Ronnie McPeters. One of the scariest inmates in the world is said to be Ronnie McPeters. Ronnie was sent to jail for the murder of a 27 year old woman in 1984. The woman, Linda Marie Baltazar, was running errands when Ronnie came up to her window panhandling. She shooed him away and he left, but then he ended up coming back, this time armed. He then shot her 5 times. As a result, he was arrested and sent to Fresno jail. But his bad behavior never stopped. While in jail, he would set fires, attack other prisoners, and even sometimes would, you know, smear his feces on the walls and floors and sometimes all over his body. Now, he was actually put on death row for his crimes, but he was deemed, and I quote, too insane to be executed. In our sixth spot, we have Joanna Danahy. Joanna is a serial killer who, in March of 2013, went on a 10 day killing spree. She murdered three men, but her goal was to murder nine. She said she wanted to be like the killers, Bonnie and Clyde. After killing the men, she would throw their bodies in ditches. In fact, she has the title of one of Britain's most notorious female murderers. While in prison, Joanna has made it a point to prove to other serial killers that she is the best killer among them. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with the inmate from hell. So, this story comes from a nurse who worked at a prison. She shared the story of the scariest inmate that she has ever encountered. This inmate would go around biting officers in their arms and shoulders. He would headbutt them as well as even punch them directly in the face. He has broken people's bones and even ripped out chunks of flesh off of them with his teeth. Yeah, that must have been terrifying to see, like what the heck? Moving on to number 4, we have Pascal Payet. Pascal Payet is a French criminal who was sent to jail for committing a murder during a robbery in 1997. But he is famous for his daring prison escapes. In 2001, this dude managed to escape prison using a hijacked helicopter. But he didn't perform this stunt just once. No, no, he escaped twice. So obviously, he was caught and then sent back to jail. Then in 2007, he did it again. It only took him 5 minutes. Within that time frame, 4 masked men hijacked a helicopter and took the pilot hostage. They then landed on the roof of the prison and used some device to open the doors and get Pascal out of his cell. Like I said, they were in and out within 5 minutes. Two days after this escape, an arrest warrant was issued against him. Nowadays, he is never kept at the same prison for more than 6 months, and he is placed in solitary confinement where he is under high surveillance. They don't want him escaping for a third time. In our third spot, we have Damien Folks. Alright folks, let's talk about Damien Folks. 
See what I did there? Anyways, this guy, don't get me started. So this guy was serving a life and term in jail for armed robbery. While in jail, he attacked a number of prisoners. He strangled killer Colin Hatch with strips of bedding and also slashed the throat of Soham murderer Ian Huntley. And this is what he had to say to that. He said, I hope I killed him. I've been planning it for weeks. Now, Ian Huntley did survive, but he had a seven inch wound that just missed his juggler vein. But that's why Damien is considered incredibly dangerous. In our second spot, we have Mark Hobson. Mark Hobson went on a killing spree in North Yorkshire, England in 2004. As a result, he took the lives of four people. But he was also involved in a nationwide manhunt, which involved more than 500 police officers and 12 police forces all looking for him. During that time, he was considered Britain's most wanted man. And this is another dude that is not afraid to get violent with others. In September of 2005, he poured a bucket of boiling water over a fellow killer. And on a number of other occasions, he has attacked other prisoners. As a result, he is another prisoner who is kept under close surveillance at all times. And in our number one spot today, we have Robert Maudsley. Robert Maudsley has actually been named Britain's most dangerous prisoner. Now you might be wondering, Lindsay, why is that? Well, oh boy, let me tell you. In 1977, Maudsley and his fellow inmates held another prisoner hostage. They tortured him for nine hours before cracking his head open and killing him. And rumor has it that he even ate some of the prisoner's brain. As a result, he was deemed the real life Hannibal Lecter. A couple months later, he murdered two other inmates, then casually told the prison officer that during the next roll call, he would be too short. As a result, he's actually kept in an isolated glass cell so guards can see what he's up to at all times. They don't want another hostage situation to occur ever again. Number 10. Abigail Williams. I'm putting Abigail Williams on this list because the whole ordeal just makes me so mad. By claiming that she was bewitched, she sparked a massive witch hunt, literally one of the most illogical points in history, leading to the most unnecessary deaths of so many people. Ugh, I hate her. I can't even watch a production of The Crucible without needing to break stuff after. It makes me so mad. Look, I don't know whether her claims were true that she and the other girls were afflicted because of witchcraft or the more likely latter event of them eating an infected piece of grain. Maybe, maybe that happened, but I'll let you decide. Abigail Williams was living with her uncle, Reverend Samuel Paris, and started practicing mild witchcraft with his daughter and Tatuba and John Indian, his slaves. You know the kind of witchcraft where you drop an egg in the water and see the name of your future husband or I don't know, like where you're gonna go tomorrow, that kind of stuff. Apparently they saw a coffin in the glass and that freaked them out. So they started acting weird. Other girls followed suit. Keep in mind they were around 11 or 12. So, all right, imagination. And then Abigail just kept accusing people like all the time. And if you admitted you were a witch, you were pardoned. And if you didn't, you were killed, okay? So technically she was never in prison but she put a lot of people there on bullshit and then they claimed possession to get out. So I say that this deserves to be number 10. Yep, there it is. <laughs> number nine, Luis Zambrano. Luis was a man from Queens who took the life of his ex-girlfriend, Angie Escobar, in her Whitestone home. She was just 28 years old and had just broken up with him when he violently attacked her, inflicting 80 wounds with a pair of scissors. But he didn't just claim that he was heartbroken, no. The reason he killed her was because of one, trust issues, that's a given, she's an ex for a reason, and two, you guessed it, demonic possession. A quote from Luis reads, quote, if you believe in demonic possession, you'd know I was under the influence of drugs and alcohol. I barely remember what happened, unquote, he said. Dude, it caught you, just fess up, man. The devil doesn't just conveniently show up when you do something really awful, okay? He's busy building the next Apple update and creating pop-up ads, okay? Thankfully, the court saw right through him and sentenced Sambreno to 26.5 years in prison. Game over, Satan. Number eight, Edder Guzman Rodriguez. In Virginia back in 2011, Rodriguez performed a violent exorcism, if you can even call it that, on his very young daughter. He attempted to rid her of the demon he believed was inside her, and it ended up costing her her life. When police arrived at the scene, several people were holding Bibles outside their home. Edder stated that while he took his daughter's life, he too was also possessed by a bad spirit. Yeah. It's called being an awful human being. Look it up. 
The girl was found on a bed wrapped in a blanket surrounded by Bibles. Guzman had also knocked his wife unconscious so she wouldn't be able to stop the exorcism. To this day, he stands by his claim while also admitting to the crime. Guzman was sentenced to 20 years and 11 months in prison. Number seven, Dennis Rader, the BTK killer. Man, I hate how this guy is on every list, but here he is again. An interview was released that Rader believed it was a demon that pushed him to take the lives of those 10 people. By now, if you follow our channel or are a true crime fan, you know what BTK stands for. And if you don't, Google it because YouTube won't let me say it. Radar was a very religious man and was a leader in his community, but despite his connection to godliness, Radar confessed that he believes a demon entered him when he was a young boy. How convenient, as that's when he started to notice his dark side. He told Larry Hatberg during an interview and I quote, how could a guy like me, a church member, raise a family, go out and do those sorts of things, he said. Quote, I personally think, and I know it's not very Christian, but I actually think it's a demon that's within me, unquote. Or you're just an awful human being saying it together. That's great. Let's move on. Number six, David Berkowitz, the son of Sam. The son of Sam terrorized NYC for a period in the 1970s and was finally caught in 1977. He would carry out what appeared to be random shootings, claiming six lives, wounding seven more with a .44 caliber revolver. David frequented lovers' lanes and women even went to salons to rid themselves of brown hair so they wouldn't be targets because they thought that was his thing. Alongside the crimes, postal worker turned shooter blamed his actions on his neighbor's dog, who he said was actually possessed by a 6,000 year old demon. Apparently his name was Harvey and Berkowitz was simply following his instructions. Number five, Pazazu Algarid. Now this one is a little freaky because one of the people who lived in the same building as Pazazu swore he was possessed. The name Pazazu is actually the name of the demon mentioned in the film, The Exorcist. Pazazu was arrested after authorities discovered a dead body in his backyard, along with another that he helped his wife bury a year prior. If there's anyone on this list that could actually have been possessed, then it might have been this guy, maybe number one. He was a satanic fanatic and even went so far as to fork his own tongue and saw his teeth razor shark. Ugh. An anonymous quote from the man who lived with Pizazu said, quote, it was very serpentine and his eyes would kind of get a little like glazy, like almost not there. Like the inner part of him would kind of phase away. You could tell when his demons needed something from him because they took over, unquote. Ugh. Also important to note that the house that he lived in was so gross, it was deemed unsafe for human life. There was filth, human and not everywhere, demonic and evil symbols on the walls. Ugh, yeah, not a place you'd want to find yourself, especially since the man who lived there might have been the demon Pazazu himself. Number four, Michael Taylor. I swear there was something about the 70s that just like bred crazy whack of serial killers. Like anyone else feel that way? Were they just there all along when we finally started to notice? I don't know, but we have yet another serial killer on our list who also claimed possession. Even before he violently took his wife's life, Taylor suspected that he was possessed by a demonic spirit. He was a simple butcher living in Osset, England, who was suddenly overcome by a darkness he couldn't explain. He underwent an overnight exorcism performed on him on October 5th, 6th in 1974, and though it reportedly worked, some of the demons, yes, plural, kept hanging on. According to someone involved, they invoked and cast out at least 40 demons, though three remained. They were pretty bad. After he returned home, he viciously took the life of his wife, removing her eyes and tongue, most of her skin from her face, and took their pet's life as well. When police found Taylor, he was standing in the street, covered in blood, yelling, quote, it is the blood of Satan, unquote. I don't know what to believe about that one. Demonic possession doesn't seem like an afterthought here, whereas it does with the other ones, so what do you think, guys? Number three, Deborah and Adolfo Gomez. Okay, whether for five minutes or 10 years, we all believed at some point that the prophecy about 2012 being the end of the world was true. But it appears no one believed as hard as Deborah and Adolfo Gomez, who were not only convinced that 2012 was the end of the world, but that their house was possessed by a 
demon. Yeah. The couple was arrested after restraining their children with duct tape in their SUV because they also were demon possessed. Apparently they would often cover their eyes and mouths with duct tape in order to keep the demons out. Oh my God. When police finally caught up with them in Lawrence, Kansas, they also discovered that Adolfo hadn't slept for nine days. How that happened, we don't know, but it may explain why he thought he was possessed. Sleep deprivation can cause some serious harm. The longest anyone has ever gone without it, I think was 11 days. And after just four or five days of no sleep, people start to hallucinate. So maybe that's the reason. Number two, Aljar Schwartz. In 2013, Aljar Schwartz from South Africa claimed he had become possessed by vague satanic attacks. Of course. He wouldn't be on this list if he didn't. This was verified by Reverend Cecil Begbie and confirmed that this was the cause for Schwartz's crime. He strangled and then beheaded his victim in an abandoned school in October of that year. Oh my God. Reports say that Aljar planned on selling the head to a traditional healer. He was caught and incarcerated, however, but his community stood behind him, weirdly. Reverend Begbie instructed church groups across Africa to pray for Schwartz on the Good Friday following his arrest. Schwartz reportedly felt like pure water was washing over him at the time of the prayer and now claims the demons are no longer in possession of him. This, however, will not mitigate his sentence. And lastly, number one, Arne Cheyenne Johnson. Johnson sparked controversy far and wide in a case that became known as the Devil Made Me Do It case. In 1981, 19-year-old Arne Cheyenne Johnson was arguing with Alan Bono over Johnson's girlfriend when Arne stabbed Bono to death. When authorities arrived, you can guess what Johnson said, the devil made me do it. Hence the title of the case. So you'd expect the officer to be like, yeah, whatever, buddy, keep on walking. But no, there is a reason this case is in our number one spot. Every paranormal investigator worth their salt, including the beloved, Ed and Lorraine Warren flocked to Connecticut to interview him. But the Warrens were there to defend him because they already knew him. The Warrens told police that in July 1980, Johnson had participated in at least three exorcisms involving his girlfriend's 11-year-old brother, David. He reportedly was host of 43 demons. The Warrens stated that at the time of the exorcism, and I quote, Johnson leaped up and cried to the demon, come into me, I'll fight you, come into me. From that time on, he was possessed. Unquote. The paranormal society was split in two, but Johnson's team was committed. The court had defended accounts of God in the past. Now it was time to defend accounts of the devil. But despite what you may believe, it wasn't enough and Johnson received maximum sentence, but was released after good behavior just four years later. Number 10, the eyeball man. Can anyone honestly say they aren't scared of this guy? The dude blacked out his eyeball, so he looked like a demonic Jack Skellington. More like Hack Skellington. Eyeball man's real name is Jason Barnum and is currently living out a 22 year sentence for shooting an Alaska police officer. Barnum's crime was heavily influenced by a hefty addiction to chasing the dragon. Three officers were investigating vehicle break ins and burglaries in South Anchorage and spotted a vehicle related to the attacks in a hotel parking lot. They checked out the security footage and saw a man carrying a tote to room 209. Barnum and two others were in the room and when officers entered the bathroom, the shootout began. Barnum was injured in the arm, but they arrested him when he got out of the hospital and they had to deal with how terrifying he looks, even though he's behind bars, so yeah. Number nine, Eric R. Rudolph. Resourceful and resilient, Eric R. Rudolph quickly got on America's most wanted list. Why? Well, during 1996 to 1998, Eric detonated bombs four times in Atlanta and Birmingham, taking the lives of two people and injuring thousands. A five year manhunt ensued. He was finally caught in May 2003 after he was found rummaging through a dumpster. Later, it was revealed how intense his survival skills were. For five years, Eric foraged off the lands and survived off of buried barrels of grain and soy. He he learned the schedules of when produce was going to be thrown out at grocery stores and stole what he could where it wouldn't be noticed. His motivation behind the bombings was a compilation of radical anti-gay, anti-abortion and anti-government. The list goes on. He didn't get along with other people and when he confessed to his crimes, he showed no remorse. But when he was taken away to go to prison, authorities report that the man had tears in his eyes, knowing he was utterly defeated. What can I say man, your actions brought you to where you are now, so sorry about it. 
sorry, not sorry. Number eight, Robert P. Hansen. The man the FBI was afraid of, and he was right under their noses. Joining them for lunch in the cafe, grabbing coffee with them, laughing at the cooler. But all the while, Robert P. Hansen was a mole. On February 18th, 2001, Robert was arrested and charged with committing espionage on behalf of intelligence services for the former Soviet Union and their successors. He was caught red handed placing a package containing highly classified information at a park in Vienna, Virginia for his Russian handlers. When the FBI searched his apartment, it became apparent his payment was in cash and diamonds with the value of over $600,000. Hansen handed over dozens of delicate files, including FBI counterintelligence investigative techniques, sources, methods, operations. He exposed the FBI's secret investigation of Felix Bloch, a foreign service officer for espionage. He pled guilty to 15 accounts of espionage on July 6, 2001 and was sentenced to prison without the possibility of parole. He is considered the most dangerous spy in FBI history. God knows what he said. Number seven, David Carpenter. I know Lisa Rena from Dancing with the Stars because I love a good foxtrot. Love it. But she's actually more well known for being a desperate housewife. But it turns out that her very own mother was actually David Carpenter's first victim. She knew him from work and he offered to give her a ride home and he had kids and a wife. Soon he was on top of her, hammer and knife in hand, but thankfully a cop was nearby who suspected something was amiss, so she was saved. David was sentenced to 14 years in prison where he was diagnosed as a sociopath with a very high IQ. He was released after only 9 years and quickly went on to commit more attacks against women. Good call on releasing him. Just saying? Like what? Ugh. I hate that. I hate that. At one time, he was even suspected of being the Zodiac Killer. Instead, he became known as the trailside killer who would prey on women on hiking trails. He took the lives of 10 people, though it's probable that there were more. Just two survived, and officers described that he was a kind of Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde kind of behavior. He was super nice, but then he had this insane, psycho, creepy, dark side as well. Number six, Zacharias Musawi. The ADX prison is intended as a holding cell to teach prisoners proper conduct before they are sent to penitentiaries. However, some are so bad that they are never released for fear they might inspire new crimes if allowed to communicate to those outside the walls. Zacharias is one of them. He is currently serving out six life sentences for assisting the hijackers who care carried out the, you guessed it, the 9-11 attacks on the World Trade Center. Musawi was placed on a watch list in 1999 when he started interacting with Islamist extremists. He could have prevented the attacks entirely, however he lied to the FBI about the Al Qaeda and their plans to attack the US. He was even supposed to pilot a plane into the White House. He was arrested in August 2001 and went on trial in 2006. Throughout the trial he praised the Al Qaeda and was removed for several outbursts. A very different tone to the note he wrote recently in 2020 renouncing Al Qaeda and appealed to younger Muslims to be wary of their deceptive ways. I really do hope he has genuinely released those ideals, however he did do it in an attempt to relax his sentence. As recently as 2018 he was still referring to himself as a natural born terrorist, so needless to say I don't see things relaxing anytime soon. Number 5 The Marathon Bomber Jahar Sarnayev Speaking of the ADX prison, there is yet another permanent resident behind its walls. Jahar Sarnayev is responsible for the 2013 Boston Marathon bombing, which took the lives of three people and injured 250 people in the large crowd. This event shook the world, and I remember when it happened. I remember checking my phone repeatedly in order to figure out what's happening and follow with updates, and I'm sure a lot of you do too. He and his brother Tamerlane used two pressure cookers packed with explosives and shrapnel. His brother was shot during a police chase while Jahar was taken into custody. He was 19 when he committed the crime and 21 when he was finally tried. The trial consisted of heartbreaking testimonies from families of the injured and the dead. The death penalty was disbanded in Boston for decades, but it was considered for this case as it was a federal case. He was instead given his life sentence to be served out in solitary confinement with no opportunities to communicate with the outside world and that is probably how it's going to remain for the rest of his life. Wow, so young. Number 4 The Nathari Killers The Nathari crimes came to light on December 29, 2006 after 8 skeletal remains of young bodies were found in the drain of a house in Nathari Noida. The owner of the house and the businessman Mohinder Singh Pander and the domestic help Surinder Kohli were arrested. Soon after they were found, even more bodies turned up. The village had been making noise about the disappearances for a while before anything was done, but now the Nathari killers remain some of the most horrific people behind bars. Over 16 young people fell victim to 
kidnapping, vicious bodily violations, and death, which believed to have occurred between 2005 to 2006. Both men have been found guilty, and the death penalty is in discussion, though has been delayed. Some believe that there is money involved in the case that may result in an unfair result, but considering the severity of the case, release is not really on the table. I'm not gonna lie, it was hard to get a straight story on this. There is a lot of convoluted details across the articles I could find, so if you have more info you want to share, drop it down below. Number three, Larry Hoover. This dude is so powerful that he was continuing to run his operation while serving out a 200 year sentence for murder. Larry Hoover was, slash is, I suppose, the chairman of the notorious Gangster Disciples Gang. He was convicted two decades ago of continuing to run his empire behind bars. Hoover, now 70, is serving out six life sentences at the Supermax Federal Prison in Florence, Colorado, a facility that holds the worst of the worst. Terrorists, mobsters, anyone who'd be a danger to anyone from the outside. It is said to be the most secure in the country. He established the gang in Chicago in the 1960s and has recently decided to try and take some of them down. The indictment accused seven state and national leaders of the gangster disciples of racketeering conspiracy, drug trafficking, witness intimidation, and multiple murders, including the 2018 death of a 65 year old ranking member of the gang on Chicago's south side. Beware if you've ever crossed Larry Hoover because even behind bars, you can't stop him. Number two, James Marcello. I honestly sound like I'm in a 1940s film noir when I was researching this. You'll see why in a second. He is the highest ranking Chicago mob boss in prison, also known as Jimmy the Man Marcello. Now at the age of 76, he filed a petition in June 2020 to have his sentence tossed out. Jimmy was one of five top criminals who were convicted of the 2007 Family Secrets racketeering case. He was convicted of taking the lives of Tony the Ants, Belotro, and his brother Michael. They were found in a cornfield in June 1986 after being beaten and strangled to death in Jimmy's basement. He was sentenced to life in prison in 2009 and currently resides at the Supermax facility in Colorado just like Mr. Hoover. Marcelo's father was also in the biz and so was his big brother, Big Mickey. The family had influence. There were crimes that hit the news and crimes no one knows about. Either way, now Jimmy wants out. He's like, ah, come on, give an old guy a break. Not for you, Jimmy. Not for you. Starting off this countdown, we have Nikolai Zumagaliev. This guy is so evil that it's hard to believe what he did was real. So Nikolai is a Soviet serial killer who took the lives of at least 10 people in the 1980s. He would target women and would often axe them to death, after in which he would eat them. In fact, he was given the name Metal Fang because he had false teeth made from white metal. That way, it was easier for him to be able to eat into the flesh. In the late 1980s, he was caught after having one of his friends over, and the friend found a human head and intestines inside of his fridge. After that, he was arrested and tried, but declared insane. In 1989, when he was transported to another facility, Nikolai actually escaped and was on the run for two years. Thankfully, he was caught and re-institutionalized. But in December of 2016, he escaped again. But officials refused to confirm the claim. Either way, be careful around this guy, like he might try and escape for the third time. Moving on to number nine, we have Alan Leger. Alan Leger is a Canadian serial killer who on June 21st of 1986, entered a convenience store in Black River Bridge, New Brunswick with two other accomplices and robbed the joint. While doing so, they beat the store owner to death, but they were later caught and arrested. He was given a life sentence and sent to prison. However, in 1989, he managed to escape and was on the run for seven months. During this time, he killed four more innocent people. He also committed arson and a list of other crimes as well. Eventually, he was recaptured and is now spending the rest of his life in Canada's Maximum Security Special Handling Unit. Moving on to number eight, we have Rodney Halbauer. Ever since Rodney was young, he has been committing crimes. It started when he was only 16 years old. During his younger years, he was arrested and released on parole a number of times. But when released, he would commit more crimes, like theft. In 1975, Rodney was released on bail after taking advantage of a lost Vegas blackjack dealer. But while on bail, he took advantage of and killed six other women and received a life sentence. However, in 1977, he actually escaped jail and kidnapped his own daughter. Shortly after, he was recaptured only to escape again in 1986. While on the run, he stabbed and injured another woman. Thankfully, once again, he was recaptured. When you think after the first time they would keep a closer eye on him? I guess not. In our seventh spot, we have Thomas Silverstein. 
Now, this dude is said to be one of the most dangerous prisoners of all time and the most violent prisoner in America. He was first jailed in 1978 for armed robbery. While in jail, he killed a prison officer and two inmates. He also was the leader for the Aryan Brotherhood prison gang for quite some time. This prison gang is the largest and deadliest prison gang in the US, with an estimated 20,000 members inside the prison and on the streets. Because of how many people he killed and injured in prison, Silverstein got transferred to a federal prison in Atlanta. There he was confined in a six by seven foot cell. He was under 24 hour surveillance. In fact, the lights in his cell were never turned off so that they could always watch him. Silverstein eventually died in prison at the age of 67. In our sixth spot today, we have Victor Figueroa. On February 6, 1997, Victor Figueroa managed to escape Moroa Shock Incarceration Facility in Mineville, New York. Victor had been serving a one to four year sentence for drug possession, but decided to take his chances and flee. When authorities noticed that he was missing, they searched the area, but all the leads ran cold. He has not been seen or heard from since. In fact, he's the only New York State prison inmate to escape and never be found. Either he's still out there or he died while trying to escape. Either way, it's a bit scary thinking that he could potentially still be out there. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with James Eddie Diggs. To the public, James Eddie Diggs seemed like a top-notch citizen. He seemed to be a great family man with a happy wife and two young sons. However, in the morning of May 26, 1949, he shot and killed his wife and kids before disappearing forever. Police did manage to find him a week later, but he managed to escape the officer by shooting him in the face and killing him. He since fled into the woods and hasn't been caught since. In fact, he was one of the FBI's 10 most wanted fugitives for the longest time, but he was eventually removed from the list in 1961 and is said to be dead by now. In our third spot, we have George Edward Wright. In 1962, George Edward Wright was convicted for murder and was sentenced to up to 30 years in prison. Wright and three other men went on a spree of armed robbery, one in which they shot a man and took off with his money, which was only $70. So was it really worth it? Anyways, they were caught and put into jail. But then in 1970, Wright managed to escape from a prison in New Jersey. He was caught and locked up once again, only to escape once more in 1972. This time, he made sure he was never going to be caught again. So he came up with a plan. This plan involved hijacking a Delta Airlines flight and collecting ransom for the release of the passengers. Upon doing so, they flew the plane to Portugal. In 2011, the police caught up with him in Portugal, but since Portugal has no extradition treaty with the United States, Wright was released. He remains a fugitive to this day. Coming in at number two, we have Eric Rudolph. In 1996, Eric Rudolph bombed Atlanta's Centennial Olympic Park during the summer games. As a result, two individuals were killed and over 100 were injured. But that was just the beginning of his deadly bombing spree. He pulled off three more bombings, injuring hundreds more. For five years, the police were on a hunt for Eric. At one point, he was one of the top 10 fugitives on the FBI's list. It wasn't until 2003 that Eric got arrested. Turns out that he was hiding in the mountains for five years. Being a skilled outdoorsman, this helped him greatly. When he was caught, he pled guilty to all four bombings and was given four life sentences without the possibility of parole. He's now spending the rest of his life in the super prison in Florence, Colorado. And in our number one spot today, we have Santiago Maduros. In 2010, Santiago fired into a random person's car because one of the passengers was wearing the wrong color jacket. The victim had no ties to any gang. He was just an innocent person riding in his sister's car. He was severely injured and his sister was unfortunately killed. A couple weeks later, Santiago and some of his friends were robbing a car. And when a group of men tried to stop them, he shot at them as well. He killed a random person that was just at the wrong place at the wrong time. From there, he was on the run for about a decade. He was finally caught in 2020 in Mexico. Starting off this countdown, we have the Hitchhiker's Killer. The Hitchhiker's Killer is the name given to serial killer Donald Henry Gaskins. He started his killings in 1969, where he would pick up hitchhikers to later kill them. It's believed that he killed more than a dozen people. But even before he went on this killing spree, Gaskins had a history of sick crimes. Finally, on November 14th of 1975, Gaskins was arrested after a man witnessed him killing two men and called the police. He was later sentenced to death, but this sentence turned into life imprisonment without any possibility of parole. However, his killings did not stop while behind bars. While in prison, he became the only man to have ever killed an inmate 
on death row. In our ninth spot today, we have Glenn Stark Chambers. In January of 1975, Glenn Stark Chambers got into a heated dispute with his girlfriend, Connie Weeks. It ended with him taking her life. As a result, he was sentenced to death by electric chair, later reduced to life imprisonment. However, Glenn escaped prison on July 13th. Glenn, with two other inmates, ganged up to attack their detention officer and then escaped through a window. Now, he was captured three days later, but only to escape several years later. So he worked with the prison to help build furniture. He came up with a good idea to put himself into one of the boxes and have himself carried out of prison in a transport truck, and it worked. Even after three decades, Glenn has never been found. If he was still alive today, he would be in his 70s, so he could still be out there somewhere. In our eighth spot, we have Ted Bundy. Now, what was so scary about Ted Bundy is how smart he was. He was the definition of evil genius. So basically, he would use his smarts to manipulate women and then kill them. Bundy is said to be responsible for murdering 30 women, although it's thought that his number is much higher. Now, Bundy was actually able to escape custody multiple times. The first time, he jumped out of a second story building and fled while at the courthouse. He had planned this for days, practicing jumping from his top bed bunk in prison down to the floor to strengthen his ankles. Now, eventually he was caught, but then a while later, he escaped again. This time, he forced himself to lose weight in order to squeeze through a hole in his cell ceiling. When he did escape the second time, he went on to murder more women, until being caught once again. In our seventh spot, we have Charles Manson. Infamous cult leader Charles Manson, who led the Manson family cult, had his followers commit crimes and murders on his behalf. Some of his members committed a series of nine murders in July and August of 1969. In 1971, Manson was convicted of first-degree murder and conspiracy to commit murder for the deaths of seven people, including film actress Sharon Tate. What's scary about Manson is that he was also an evil genius. If you've ever seen his interviews, he acts quite wild and strange. People think that he's out of his mind. At one point, he was diagnosed with schizophrenia and paranoid delusion disorder, but some people think that he he was just too smart for his own good and he was just faking all of this. In 1971, Manson received the death sentence, but a year later the government got rid of capital punishment, so his sentence was changed to life in prison instead. In our sixth spot, we have Ian Brady and Myra Hindley. Between 1963 and 1965, Ian Brady and Myra Hindley worked together to torture, take advantage of, and kill a number of young individuals. What they did was incredibly messed up and it'll make your stomach churn. Now, these two were actually given the name the Moors Murderers, because after taking the lives of their victims, they would bury their bodies on the Moors outside of Manchester. Both individuals were sentenced to life in prison for their crimes. Ian was actually placed in solitary confinement, whereas Myra died in prison in 2002. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with Lester Eubanks. In 1965, Lester was convicted of taking the life of Mary Ellen Diener. As a result, he was given the death penalty, which later got changed to a life sentence. Now, over the years in prison, apparently Lester changed his ways and became very well behaved. In fact, on December 7th, 1973, they let him go out to Christmas shop for his family. While out in a mall, he managed to escape his guards and flee. To this day, he still hasn't been caught. He's out there somewhere in hiding. Who knows where he fled to or what he's up to now. Coming in at number four, we have Robert William Fisher. Now, this guy is one of the FBI's most wanted fugitives. He is on the run after a triple homicide and arson. On April 9th, 2001, Fisher took the lives of his wife and two children before blowing up their house. It is still unclear as to why he did this, and he's been on the run ever since. And please have no leads. On April 20th, his car was found in a forest near Payson, Arizona, but Robert was nowhere to be found. On November 3rd, 2021, Fisher was removed from the FBI's most wanted fugitives list. But despite them doing this, he still remains a very wanted fugitive. In our third spot, we have Bradford Bishop. Bradford Bishop Jr. is a former United States Foreign Service officer who is now a wanted fugitive. On March 1st of 1976, Bishop started to spiral after not receiving the promotion he really wanted. He then left his work early, drove to the bank, withdrew money, and then bought a sledgehammer, gas can, shovel, and pitchfork. He then returned home where he killed his wife, mother, and three sons. He then drove the body several miles away before burying them in a wooded swamp area 
before setting them on fire. As a result, he was placed on the FBI's list of 10 most wanted fugitives. They have no clue as to where Bishop is now. He could be anywhere, but they do believe that he fled to Europe. Moving on to number two, we have Arthur Hutchinson. Arthur Hutchinson has lived a life of crime for murder, attempted murder, theft, and burglary. In fact, he spent five years in prison for the attempted murder of his half-brother. In September of 1983, he was brought into a police station after being arrested for theft. While there, he asked to go to the bathroom and then proceeded to jump out of the bathroom window and fled. He was on the run for three and a half weeks. While on the run, he crashed a wedding and murdered the bride's father, mother, and brother. Later that day, he broke into another person's home and stabbed all three of the residents to death. He was finally caught on November 5th of 1983 and sentenced to life imprisonment. And in our number one spot today, we have Ahmed Siraji. From 1986 to 1997, Ahmed took the lives of 42 females. The bodies of his victims were found in a sugarcane field. What he would do was after killing them, he would bury them waist deep in his field with their heads facing his house. He believed that by doing so, this gave him great power. But he was later caught and arrested alongside his sisters and three wives who helped him. One of his wives was actually sentenced to death, but that was later changed to life imprisonment. Starting off in our number 10 spot, we have Angel Resendez. Also known as the Railroad Killer, Angel is said to have committed somewhere around 23 horrific crimes during his spree in both the United States and Mexico in the 1990s. He went on to become known as the Railroad Killer because of the fact that most of his crimes were committed near railroads where he had just jumped off of trains he was using to travel around the country. Most of his crimes took place in the homes of those he harmed, and usually after the crimes he'd linger around to eat their food and sometimes steal their sentimental items. Sometimes he'd even take jewelry to re-gift to his mother and sister. In June of 1999, he was listed on the FBI's 10 Most Wanted Fugitives list, and when his sister saw him there, she was worried he would continue harming people, so she thankfully contacted the authorities. After after this, they were able to convince him to surrender and he was sent to trial. In the end, he was sentenced to death by the jury and although there were multiple appeal attempts, his death warrant was signed and on June 27, 2006, he received his sentence. In our number 9 spot today, we have the Long Island Serial Killer. Also known as the Craigslist Ripper, the LISK is an unidentified suspect who is believed to have taken the lives of 10 to 16 people over the last 20 years. The victims so far that are known have been sex workers who used Craigslist list to advertise their work. After the disappearance of Shannon Gilbert, police were searching an area along the Ocean Parkway, and that is when they began to discover the remains of the victims. The first four were found in December of 2010, with another six being found in March and April of 2011. As of December 2015, the FBI is now officially involved in the investigation. There has been a suspect in this case, but any formal charges have not been laid in terms of these crimes. The most recent evidence in regards to these cases was a belt found at the scene of the crime, which may potentially belong to the killer. At the same time, it was announced that new scientific evidence was being used in the investigation, but these announcements came just last year, so we have yet to receive any further updates. Hopefully this case is solved quickly so that the families of the victims can receive justice and this terrible person is off the streets for good. In our number 8 spot today, we have Richard Chase. This evil person is said to have taken the lives of 6 people within the span of a month between 1977 and 1978. That's a lot of people people in a very short amount of time, which is absolutely terrifying. Before his crimes, Richard's life was already full of terrible stories and horrific acts that had him spending time in mental institutions before his crime spree. While at these facilities, he was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia, but after going through treatment and beginning medication, he was deemed to no longer be a threat to society and was released into his mother's care. Here's where things take a turn for the worse, however. Instead of helping take care of Richard, his mother instead weaned him off of his medication and got him all set up with his own apartment. Nice. Really helpful and cool of her. Initially when he moved into the apartment he had roommates but eventually they all moved out and he was alone which is when things really got wild. He began killing various animals, which he would then eat raw, sometimes mixing the organs with Coca-Cola in a blender and then drinking it. It's horrible. After this, he would unfortunately go on his killing spree, which had horrific details and would only end when he was startled by a visitor at the home of where his final crime took place. He fled the scene, but he was later caught and stood trial. Although there were many attempts to have him be spared of the death sentence, in the end, this didn't work. In December of 1980, Richard was found passed away in his jail cell 
well after taking too many of his prescribed medication. In our number 7 spot today we have Rodney Alcala. Rodney is a horrible monster who was convicted and sentenced to death for 5 killings that he committed in California from 1977 to 1979. He also received an additional 25 years to life after pleading guilty to two other killings in New York in 1971 and 1977. Rodney got away with his crimes for a while because he wasn't the top of the list of suspects because he was said to be the quote, charming photographer. Rodney is often referred to as the dating game killer because of his appearance on the show, which with what we now know about him is absolutely horrifying. What's crazy is that he actually won the show he was on, but the episode's bachelorette refused to go on a date with him because she found him creepy. This is just a reminder to always trust your instincts. It isn't exactly known just how many victims Rodney had, it is potentially thought that it could be much higher than the number he was convicted for. In July of last year, Rodney passed away in prison at the age of 77. In our number 6 spot today we have Charles Cullen. This guy used to be a nurse who took the lives of his patients throughout his career and he may be one of the worst serial killers ever recorded. He confessed to taking the lives of 40 people but through subsequent interviews it became apparent that the number was way higher than 40, he just couldn't remember the names of all of them. But of course, he could remember the details of all of his crimes against them. His crime started in 1988 and spanned over a decade into 2003. In October of 2003, when a patient at a hospital passed away from low blood sugar, the authorities were called. This person was Charles' final victim and authorities began looking into him and investigating his past employment history. On December 12th, 2003, authorities were arresting him and charging him with only one count of his crimes, but he ended up admitting to 40. He ended up pleading guilty to his crimes and arranged a plea deal where authorities would not seek the death penalty if he cooperated. During one of his court proceedings, he continuously asked the judge to step down and apparently repeatedly chanted for 25 minutes straight, even after he was restrained and gagged for his outbursts. It is thought that his victims might be up in the 400 range, which is truly just unbelievable. In our number 5 spot today, we have John Allen Muhammad and John Lee Malvo. This pair is referred to as the DC Snipers and they were responsible for a series of coordinated attacks during a three week period in October of 2002. The pair took the lives of 10 people and critically injured three others during this spree, although their crimes spanned even before this and involved even more people. Their crimes were random and terrifying, people would just be going about their everyday tasks when this horrific pair would strike. Through a series of quote unquote mistakes the pair made, they were able to be caught by authorities and arrested. In September of 2003, John Allen was sentenced to death and this sentence was carried out in November of 2009. John Lee, on the other hand, was sentenced to six consecutive life sentences, but very recently it was determined that his sentence needs to be re-looked at because of his young age when the crimes were committed. In our number 4 spot today we have Lawrence Bideker and Roy Norris. A two for one of the most horrific kind, this pair was often referred to as the tool box killers. They received this name because most of what they used to commit their crimes would be items normally stored in a household toolbox. The pair committed five of these crimes in Southern California over a five month period in 1979. In the end, what led to their capture was when Roy met up with a friend with whom he had previously been incarcerated with. He confessed the crimes to this person in great detail, and you know what this person did? They consulted their attorney about this horrifying confession who then advised them to go to the authorities with the information. Thank goodness. Authorities, while they didn't have the evidence necessary to charge the men with the crimes at that time, were able to, through surveillance, find other things to arrest them for, while they searched their homes to find the evidence that they really did need. The pair stood trial and in the end, Lawrence was sentenced to death and Roy, who accepted a plea bargain and agreed to testify against Lawrence, received a life sentence. Lawrence died of natural causes while on death row in December of 2019, as did Roy at the California Medical Facility in 2020. 20. FBI Special Agent John E. Douglas described Lawrence as the most disturbing individual for whom he has ever created a criminal profile. In our number 3 spot today we have Robert Hansen. Robert is often referred to as the Butcher Baker and his story truly is horrific. He is one of the most prolific serial killers in Alaska's history because for over a decade he would kidnap women and bring them into the wilderness where he would then stalk them like prey. The reason he got away with his crimes for so long is because outside of these horrifying crimes, 
times. He was just a soft-spoken baker. Robert was heading to church by day and prowling the streets at night. What led to the downfall of this horrible monster was a badass named Cindy Paulson who was able to escape from Robert and was sure to leave evidence behind. She then went to authorities and told them what happened and this led to a search warrant for Robert's property, which is where all the evidence they needed lied. Robert is believed to have taken the lives of at least 17 women and in 1983 he was sentenced to 461 years and a life sentence without the possibility of parole. In our number 2 spot today we have William Bonin. This horrible person is said to be responsible for taking the lives of 21 young men in Southern California from May of 1979 to June 1980. It is said that on at least 12 of these occasions he was assisted by one of his four known accomplices and it is even speculated that he might be responsible for 15 more of these crimes that evidence hasn't officially been able to connect him to. He was often referred to as the freeway killer because of the fact that most of the bodies were found along the freeway of Southern California. The police surveilled William until they could catch him in the act, which they did. In the beginning, he claimed innocence. I mean, they caught him in the act. It's kind of dumb to claim innocence. But after receiving an impassioned letter from one of the victim's mothers, which asked him to please share the location of her son's body, he confessed his guilt. But he made sure to clarify that it wasn't so the mother could be at peace or so that her pain could be eased. No, of course not. Instead, he said, quote, I was dying for a hamburger and I knew if I went out with the cops, they would get me a hamburger. At his first trial, the prosecutor described him as, quote, the most arch evil person who ever existed. William was convicted on 14 of his crimes and was sentenced to death. He spent 14 years on death row before his sentence was carried out in 1996. In our number one spot today, we have Israel Keys. Israel is quite a prolific serial killer and truly is a terrifying person. While everyone on this list is horrible, Israel is particularly scary because of the fact that he had no MO or type, he just killed at random. In fact, he was so prepared for these random crimes that he left kill kits all over the US so that he would be prepared for whenever whoever he chose crossed his path. It isn't quite clear how many of these crimes he committed and many missing persons reports that are still open could potentially be linked to him. It is said that Israel had a sort of admiration and obsession with other prolific serial killers like Ted Bundy or Robert Hansen who we already talked about today. He even said, quote, I probably know every single serial killer that's ever been written about. It's kind of a hobby of mine. So creepy. In March of 2012, Israel was finally apprehended and was to stand trial for his crimes, but unfortunately, while waiting for trial, he went on to take his own life. He left behind a note and a drawing of 11 skulls, which led authorities to believe that this may be the number of victims he had. Mm -hmm. 